Hello, and once again, welcome to another Sunday uh, School Bible Study. Uh, I'm your host, Chris Short. We've been doing this now for uh, a little over two years, and we're still having a wonderful time doing it. Uh, our online sessions have been uh, about a year and a couple of months now, and that was because the pandemic shut our church down like it shut down many of yours. Uh, I am honored that you took the time to be with us this morning and take a look at our Sunday School lesson, take another look into the, to our journey uh, into the Bible, looking at the, the things that our Savior said to us, looking at the history of the Old Testament, how it predicted His coming, and the uh, activities of the New Testament where they followed up on uh, His ministry after He had left this earth. Uh, I'm grateful that you're here. I'm honored that you're here. I consider it a privilege to be able to, to preach God's Word and to help in some small way to grow His church. Before we begin, would you pray with me, please? Our dear Father in heaven, once again we come before you to look into your Word. A Word, Father, that is thousands of years old and yet has never changed, has never been updated, has never needed to be revised. We thank you, Father, for that Word. We thank you for that truth that remains constant in our lives. We just ask, Father, that you'll be with us always, that we might recognize that we have the honor, the privilege of living in a country that enables us to own our own copies of that story, to own our own Bibles, and to read that Bible without fear of, of rec recrimination or uh, without fear of being uh, scolded or arrested or, or possibly even put to death as Christians are in many parts of the world. We thank you, Father, for the the men who took the time to write down your words and to record them for us, and those who have faithfully translated for them for us over the years. We thank you for those who have traveled throughout the world and spread your word, spread your son's word, spread the gospel to all those who are waiting to hear it. We recognize, Father, that there are many who, who still do not know the name of Jesus Christ, and there are still others who have heard that name but either haven't heard or don't understand his message. Bless us, Father, that in some small way we might each be able to take part in that, that great commission that commanded us to go and make disciples of all the nations. Help us, Father, that we might be able to boldly stand in front of someone who does not know or does not understand and proclaim to them that, yes, I am a Christian, and let me tell you why. Bless us, Father, now as we look into your word, as we look into the activities of the early church, and help us to understand how those words, those messages, those incidents in their lives might apply to each and every one of us in our current lives. We thank you, Father, for those messages. We thank you for the one about whom they are, your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. We spoke last week about the, uh, well, I, I, I entitled the, the message, Escape Artists, Magicians, and so on. And, and we talked about Peter, when Peter escaped from the, the jail cell that he, where he had been imprisoned by Herod Agrippa, who had arrested him, uh, intending to put him to death, but had to wait until the Passover was completed. And it was during that Passover that an angel of the Lord came and freed Peter from his chains and, and walked him past 16 guards and then allowed him to, to travel to the home of the, the worshipers who were there praying for him. It was after that time that uh, Peter went down to Caesarea and the Bible tells us he stayed there. I also mentioned that there are Bible scholars who, who view this, this particular act, this freeing of Peter and then he basically leaving the scene as the transition from Peter to James as head of the church. Uh, those same scholars place this event about 44 AD, roughly 10 years after the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven. During that period of time, the church grew, and it grew tremendously among the, the Jewish people of Jerusalem. But recall, if you will, the church also suffered great persecution during that time, and, and the loss of many of its members due to the activities of the ruling authorities who, who saw this, this new movement, this growing movement of the, the people of the way, as a threat to their own positions and their, own, their positions in society and in government in dominating the people which were then under Roman rule. As a consequence, we're told in Acts 11, 
uh, verse 19, that to escape the persecution that ensued after the martyrdom of Stephen, those who were scattered after the persecution that rose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. And it's that city of Antioch that we want to look at today uh, so that we have an idea of exactly what was going on and who was there. In reality, there are, there are two Antiochs. The first is Antioch of Pisidia, which was uh, north of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, the second, and perhaps the, the most important to us, was Antioch of Syria, which is located near the, the headwaters of the Orontes River, which lies very near today the, near the city of Antakya, uh, Turkey, and, and Antakya, of course, draws its name from Antioch. This particular city of Antioch was founded near the end of the 4th century BC, and it eventually became one of the most important cities in the eastern half of the Roman Empire. It was about one-fifth of the area of Rome itself, and it became the third largest city in the Roman Empire after Rome and Alexandria of Egypt. It was home to many as 500,000 people at one time, a mix of local settlers from Antigonia. Uh, they had Macedonians there. They had Jews. And those Jews were, were given full status from the, the very beginning of the activities in Antioch when it was starting to grow. In fact, Julius Caesar in 47 BC visited the city of Antioch and guaranteed the citizens of Antioch their freedom. And so it was a, a mixed pagan and, and Christian population. And historians, uh, Marcellonius, implied that, that they lived together in basically in harmony without any problems. In fact, uh, it's said that the emperor Titus set up the, uh, the cher cherubim gate uh, entering into the Jewish community and that he set the uh, cherubim that had been captured from the Jewish temples uh, when the temple was destroyed over one of those gates. Somewhere between 177 and 192 AD, the Olympic Games were held in Antioch. A Antioch had become a, a center of early Christian activity during Roman times, and its large population of people with, with Jewish origins uh, attracted the early missionaries. Peter went to Antioch, and later Barnabas and Paul. That was the beginning of Paul's first missionary journey. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, and by the, about 390 AD, uh, Chrysostom, who was a historian, estimated that there were about 100,000 Christians living in Antioch. So while the early church had nonetheless experienced a, a fair modicum of peace following the conversion of Saul, even though the, the persecution continued over the years, you recall Herod had James, John's brother, arrested and beheaded. Uh, he arrested Peter, who was released when the angel rescued him. Uh, Herod eventually met his own end when uh, he started thinking that he was, was pretty important, and some of his subjects called him a god, and, and Herod uh, pretty much admitted, yeah, I, I guess I am a god. And uh, Acts 12.23 tells us, then immediately... An angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. So following Herod's death, Acts 12, 24 tells us, but the word of God grew and multiplied. So some time actually passes between the end of chapter 9 and the beginning of chapter 13, possibly about 15 years. So if you're a member of my regular Sunday school class at First Baptist Church of Lexington, Missouri, and you have your Gospel Project Sunday School manual with you, I'd invite you to turn to page 67. For those of you who are following along in your own Bibles, we want to begin today with the book of Acts. We want to start in chapter 13, and we want to look at the very first verse, verse 1. It reads like this. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who was sometimes called Manassan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now, 
it's apparent that the, the church leadership in the city of Antioch was, was quite diverse. Uh, Barnabas was a Jewish Levite. Uh, he was uh, apparently fairly wealthy. Remember, he had property that he sold so that he could give the money to the, the early church. And, and he was from Greek society on the island of Cyprus. Uh, there was Simeon. Uh, Simeon was also called Niger, which basically means Simon the Black. So he could have been a son of African proselytes to Judaism, Judaism or perhaps he was even a, a convert himself. Uh, we aren't told much about uh, Lucius of Cyrene, but like Barnabas, he was from that uh, Mediterranean island, and his name shows that he was a Hellenist. Uh, Menaean, or Menasen, uh, had connections with nobility. He grew up with Herod the Tetrarch. And then, of course, we, we have the, the hero of the story, the man we better know as, known as Saul. By this time, Saul had about 15 years' experience, and he could be considered a, a veteran evangelist. He was a church planner, a Bible teacher. Uh, Jesus called him personally, and he was able to move very easily in Gentile circles. Uh, he was a bit of an outsider because he was from Tarsus, but it seems obvious that the, the leadership of the Antioch church was a reflection of the ethnic and, and cultural diversity of, of that great city. So these men who were called prophets and teachers were leading the early church. These two roles, the roles of prophet and, and teacher, were basically leadership gifts for the church. The Jewish, Jewish synagogues had always had teachers, although the extent to which they were leaders is kind of unclear. Uh, prophets were those who uh, interpreted and, and spread the word of God as it was given to them or as it was brought to them by others, uh, particularly Jesus himself. And later in the, later in the first century of the church, uh, overseers and deacons were appointed to fulfill the, the ministry that the prophets and teachers had had. And so as we turn to uh, Acts 13.2, we get this message. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. See, it was the Lord himself that, that was appointing Barnabas and Saul. And it was work to which he was appointing them. They weren't being sent out by the church. Perhaps it was in response to, to Jesus' commandment, which we call the Great Commission, that closes out the, the uh, Gospel of Matthew, uh, when the Lord admonished all of us to go out and make disciples, followers of, the, of all the people. Uh, and so the, the uh, leadership of the church at that point fasted, and they prayed, and then they laid hands on them. Verse 13, 3 tells us, Then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them, they sent them away. Now, the, the laying on of hands was not necessary for these two to, to receive the Holy Spirit, as some religious groups uh, feel is necessary, because obviously these two had already been filled with, the, with that particular gift, that Holy Spirit. But it was rather done in continuing a, a tradition that existed since the, the time of Moses, it was the church's way of identifying and affirming the mission to which God had called a particular individual, or in this case, two individuals. It wasn't the church that was sending these two men. It was God himself. And the church was showing its support of them by confirming the command of God. We turn to verse 4. It tells us, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Now, Cyprus, of course, was the home of Barnabas, and it's also the home of Manasseh, or Menean, who may have been one of the very first converts at Pentecost because he's described as being an old or early disciple, at least in the historical literature. Uh, and Acts, of course, 11, 7, 11, 19, of course, tells us that after Stephen's death, the Christians scattered and traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews which resulted in the Lord uh, blessing their efforts. And according to Acts 11.21, uh, it tells us a, a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So let's go on one more verse. 
to Acts 13.5, and that tells us when Barnabas and Saul arrived in Salamis, which is at the uh, northeastern end of the island of Cyprus, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their assistant. Now, from this verse, it would seem that, at least in the very beginning, uh, Barnabas and Saul were preaching the Savior only in the synagogues, which meant they were preaching only to the Jews who attended the synagogue, at least at first. Uh, the John mentioned here is John Mark. Uh, that would be the cousin of Barnabas, the one who, uh, who traveled with them for a while and then left. Uh, the one who traditionally is the one who we say wrote the, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, Mark was brought up in Jerusalem, and he was unfamiliar with the the Gentile history, the Gentile language, the Gentile way of life, uh, the culture of the Greeks, and that may have influenced somewhat his decision to return to Jerusalem, which we're told about in uh, verse 13. Um, in Acts 6, the first part of Acts 6, 6a, tells us this. Now, when they had gone through the island, to Paphos, and Paphos is at the, the extreme southwestern end of the island of Cyprus. Uh, and, and when it says they went through the island, that kind of indicates to me that they, they pretty much traveled as they, walked, as they went and uh, preached where they could, but maybe they were not having a, a great deal of success. Uh, at least they didn't until they reached the, the city of Paphos. Um, to, up to that point, the, their efforts on the island of Cyprus just simply hadn't amounted to much. But in Paphos, things were about to change. The second half of that scripture, verse uh, 6b in Acts 13, tells us this. They found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a, name, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. Now, Bar-Jesus means... Uh, son of Joshua, or son of Jesus in Aramaic, and the name Jesus in and of itself was not, not a totally unusual or uncommon name uh, during those times. Uh, wasn't particularly identified with anything special until it was associated with the name Christ, and we had Jesus the Christ. So this was a, a special Jesus, one that was, was different than all of the others. So we had this Bar Jesus, this son of Jesus, and Bar Jesus was called a sorcerer, which in biblical times meant uh, he was engaged in the acts of uh, using spells or chatting to spirits, and it, it was used in reference to uh, an immoral or false practice. Under these particular circumstances, the, the sorcery of Bar-Jesus can best be seen as a, an effort to, to circumvent God's knowledge and sovereignty, and perhaps to have the people worship Satan instead. Bar Jesus perhaps was the, the spiritual advisor to the proconsul of Cyprus on the matters of faith. Uh, the proconsul, Sergius, was a, an official of ancient Rome. Uh, he acted on behalf of Rome, and he was obviously a learned man, uh, at least concerning Jewish teachings, and, and Bar Jesus, being Jews, J Jewish, was probably the one to answer his, his questions and his concerns, at least up to that point in time. Verse 7 tells us this. Bar Jesus was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man, and this man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Now, if the man was intelligent and had uh, some knowledge of Jewish practices, it seems to me that he would want to hear from these two uh, missionaries, these two learned, these two respected, revered uh, people of the Jewish faith, these two people of uh, members of the people of the way, about what they knew, what they had heard, what they had seen in relation to Jesus Christ. And so uh, he called for Barnabas and Saul to come to him and speak to him. And it's, it's pretty clear from the passage that, that Bar Jesus had the ear of the proconsul and, and was probably well known in the area. We don't know what the agenda was of Bar Jesus, but he proclaimed himself as a as a prophet of God, and he may have had his own religious agenda. In fact, 
uh, verse 8 tells us, but Elymas, the sorcerer, that's how his name is translated, withstood them, Barnabas and Paul, and he sought to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Now, as a Jew, Elymas, or Bar-Jesus, would have been well aware of Moses' law against uh, sorcery and uh, divination, and he knew that that was found in, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and he also would be aware of God's warnings against false prophets. But he had his own agenda, what, whatever that was, and he chose to ignore the knowledge that, that he had, the knowledge of, of history, the knowledge of Jewish tradition, and to proclaim himself a prophet and to spread whatever false information he cared to spread. He may have thought that these two, Barnabas and Saul, were just two more Christians like the ones he'd already encountered on the island of Cyprus. But he hadn't counted on Saul. Verse 13.9 tells us this. Uh, okay, let's see if we can find it here. Ah, I think I may have left that out of the... They have left that out of the video. Oh. So, uh, as it, um, Saul, who is uh, called Paul, looked intently at the man. Uh, and it, at this point, that uh, Saul is, is for the very first time identified by his Roman name, Paul. Since his mission from that point would primarily be to the Gentiles, it makes sense that his Roman name would also be used throughout the rest of his ministry. That would identify him as a, as a Gentile who became a follower of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And, and Paul's name is translated as small one. But if his statue, stature was diminu diminutive, there was nothing about him that was going to be deterred by a, a self-proclaimed prophet and sorcerer. In fact, Paul spoke directly to this would-be prophet, and he said this in, verses, in verse 10 of Acts 13. He said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Notice that these two verses tell us first that, that Paul looked intently at Bar-Jesus before he speaks telling him that he's doing the work of the devil. Perhaps Paul was seeing in Elymas the man who had been the one previously doing the work in, in persecuting the church, Saul himself. And perhaps he recognized just how abhorrent his works, his acts, had been at that time. P perhaps Paul was looking intently at the man and trying to determine exactly what he needed to do according to the Holy Spirit as he listened to, to the words of Elymas, or Jesus. Or perhaps he was trying to figure out exactly who this man was and, and how he might be hindering the message that he and Barnabas were about to deliver. In any case, Paul may have recalled how Jesus handled him on the road to Damascus. Elymas was where Paul had been years earlier. And the horror that his pronounced affliction brought to him, who was Saul and then Paul, through the power of the Lord and Savior, Paul then chose to pronounce that same punishment upon Elymas. Acts uh, 13 verse 11a tells us, And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind not seeing the sun for a time. Now, I have no doubt that acting through the, the power of the Lord and acting uh, upon the Lord's wishes, Paul could have exacted any sort of punishment upon Elymas that, that he might have wished and anything that God might have commanded. But at that point in his life, the most severe punishment Paul had ever received had been the loss of his eyesight. And now, in, in recalling that incident, he visited that same affliction upon Elymas. He said, you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. 
And the second half of verse 11 tells us immediately a dark mist fell on him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And if you recall, when Paul became blind or when Saul became blind on the road to Damascus, he needed someone to take him by the hand and, and lead him around. And so Paul's probably referring to, to his own affliction when he, he's talking to Elymas here. I've... I've read of people who have gradually gone blind, uh, and many of them were able to accept their fate while remembering their, their now lost ability to see because they had seen these things. And so when, when people talked of them, they, they realized that their sight had gradually faded away, and they still have very vivid memories. And I've also read of people who went instantly blind for whatever reason, whether it was through medication or accident or injury or something like that. And, and they suffered an entirely different fate. They, they weren't able to, to comprehend as well what had, what had happened to them and, and why perhaps that had happened. It seemed the, the second group, the ones who went blind instantly, were the ones who suffered the most or had the hardest time to, to adjust to the loss of sight. I personally cannot imagine what the feelings would be if you were to suffer such a, a huge sensory loss. It would seem that, that Paul was perhaps visiting upon Elymas the, the worst possible scenario that he can imagine. But I got thinking, could, could we consider for, for maybe just a moment that Paul was not calling down a, a curse upon Elymas, so much as he was seeking a way in which Jesus might bless Elymas in the same way that, that Paul himself had been blessed. The, the pronouncement upon Elymas was not for permanent blindness, but only for a time. And perhaps that would provide Elymas the opportunity to reflect, even as Paul had done during the, the three days of blindness that he suffered, time to reflect upon the choices that he had made in his own life. Paul even went so far uh, in the scripture as to link Elymas to his, his own earlier plight by referring the need to be, to be led by the hand as Paul had, had to be done in his own case. I'd like to believe that, that Elymas being struck blind was, was not a punishment for his actions, but rather a a planned action by God through his servant Paul to reach yet another another person that he might consider a lost sheep. In any case, we're, we're told no further about Elmas. But what of the proconsul who apparently was there and, and witnessed the entire incident between the three men? Verse 12 provides us with the answer. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what has been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Notice the proconsul had asked Barnabas and Paul to come to him and explain what the teachings of Jesus Christ were, what they meant, and, and how that might affect him, an, an intelligent man. The, the reasons one might consider becoming a, a part of this, this new and growing movement. The two missionaries had not yet had a chance to explain to the proconsul exactly what the message was of Jesus. And instead, they were confronted by Elymas, who tried to prevent them from speaking. And now, through the power of God, through the pronouncement of, of Paul, no further explanations were necessary. Uh, he, the proconsul witnessed the power of God working through these two men, and he believed. He observed the behavior of the two who obviously were messengers of the Lord, and he believed. And so it is with us. So it is with the, the people we come in contact with. They, they may or may not know us, but if, if they can see in us the power of Jesus Christ, the, the ability of Jesus Christ to change lives, the willingness of Jesus Christ to accept us regardless of our past, then perhaps they too will begin to believe. Now, 
I have no doubt that Barnabas and Paul went on to explain to the, the proconsul uh, everything that he desired to know about the gospel, everything he desired to know about Jesus Christ, and, and pretty much everything he needed to know about this, this movement of the people of the way. But I think it's just as obvious that his belief was one of, of total and, and committed belief, which he did from his own observations. Call it miraculous, if you will. Uh, sometimes that's all it takes. Somebody sees something that happens that they they feel was a miracle, a, a, a happening that couldn't be explained any other way, and immediately they'll become believers. For others, it's a, a prolonged time of study and observation and, and witnessing the behavior and the belief and the faith of others before they come to, to Jesus. It still demands that there be someone who's there to, to teach them and, and to tell them. And of course, that in present days, that responsibility falls on us. I, I think this would be an interesting place to in, uh, inject a little side note. Up to this point, the mention of Paul in the, the biblical rendition of what's happening in Acts has always followed the mention of Barnabas, as in Barnabas and Paul. After this, uh, it was no longer Barnabas and Paul went here or Barnabas and Paul went there. From this point on, the names are changed and it becomes Paul and Barnabas. Uh, and that's significant when you consider that, that Paul goes on to have the, the biggest influence on the remainder of the New Testament. He was the, the principal author of many of the New Testament books. Uh, and so this, this change, when Luke was writing the book of Acts, this change when he starts recognizing Paul in the, the number one position and Barnabas following him rather than the other way around, seems to indicate that there is going to be a great future for Paul. And of course, we, we know what that future entails as he, as he goes about on his missionary journeys and all of the, the events and so on that happen concerning there. Uh, it's a small change, I recognize that, but it is worth noting because it's always the small changes that seem to make the, the biggest difference in a person's life. I, I won't discount my own miraculous happenings, but I, I think they're the exception rather than the rule. I look at my own life, my own journey to this point, and, and I can't name a a single miraculous happening that, that brought me to the point of where I am. But I do see many small changes that, uh, that's, uh, well, that to me at least would be considered too numerous to mention. And I suppose if I was completely honest, each one of those small changes would have to be considered a, a miracle in its own right. And the entirety of my life would have to be considered miraculous as the the workings of God and his son Jesus Christ even the bad times even the hard times if you look at your life wouldn't you consider it a history of small miraculous happenings that that couldn't be considered accidental or coincidental that that brought you to the point of where you are i i hope you can see Jesus in as being in control of of what's happening to you. Uh, if you can, and if you think that, that small miracles add up to large miracles, including a possibility of completely changing one's life, won't you take time to reflect on the message that, that God had for you through his son, the message that he gave to us uh, that closed out the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 19, where Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. And I know it's not easy. I know it's difficult sometimes for us to approach a, a stranger or, or even worse, a, a friend or family member who we know isn't a Christian or someone we know isn't a, a believer or possibly doesn't understand the message and, and to say to them, Yes, I, I am a Christian and let me tell you why. That's hard, but 
all of the the holy men and women of the Bible, all of those who who made any inroads, all of those who did any preaching, who did any converting, who did any sort of miraculous work, all of them trusted in the power of God and His Son Jesus Christ to to accomplish the things they did. Way back from Old Testament times, all the way through to to the end of the the New Testament, and even the promises that are yet to come in the book of Revelation, all of those writings, all of those people, all of those individuals trusted in God, and, and, and that's all he wants us to do. If we will put our faith and our trust and our confidence in God, we, we know with the miracles that have taken place in our lives, we, we know how they added up to, to make us who and what we are. It, it's just a mess, matter of, of passing that message on to others. You see, we know what we know, and it's enough. We don't necessarily have to, to study more or learn more or pray more to be able to go out and talk to somebody. We have the message, and we have the command of Jesus, the one that's found in Matthew that says go. And I don't know that Jesus intended you to have to be able to go to, to dozens or hundreds or thousands. I think if you went to one, I think if each one of us served just one person who, who didn't understand the message of Jesus Christ, who didn't understand the gospel, who didn't understand the, the promises that can be theirs by living a, a better life, if each one of us would serve one of them in his name, that would be enough. That would be all that was really needed to, to spread his word, to, to grow his church. Uh, that's, that's my command from the Lord, to, to preach his word and to, to grow his church. And I don't claim to have been able to make any huge inroads or any uh, huge uh, accomplishments. I, I've been fortunate and blessed enough to have baptized some people. I, I've been able to, to marry some people. I've, I've had the opportunity to preach at the funerals of some people who I knew were Christians who I knew were, were going to that place that Jesus had promised them. And, and for me, that's enough. I, I don't have to be given fame or honor or glory. Those are gods. They always have been. They always will be. I, I simply ask him that I might be used as a tool, a, a tool that might somehow even just move one person one step closer to him so that when their time comes, when they realize that they need more in their life than what they currently have, and they, and they want to reach out their hand trying to find that, that one to grasp onto, if I've moved them just one step closer to God where they can reach out and, and find his hand waiting for them as it once did for, for each and every one of us, for me included, then that's enough. I would feel like I have justified my, my existence, justified what I was, was called to do. And if we should make inroads for two people or more, so much greater our, our satisfaction, so much greater our enjoyment, so much greater our blessings. My prayer would be that whatever you do in life, wherever you go, you might always have the, the courage of knowing that Jesus is with you, God is behind you, and that he has prepared a way for you to stand in front of that person who does not know his son, who does not understand his message, and be able to proclaim to them, proclaim to them, yes, I am a Christian. Let me tell you why. Simple enough, but we have to take that first step. And I'd encourage you to do that. I'd encourage you to look for those people in your lives, whether it's friends or family or neighbors or someone you run across at the grocery store or the gas station. Listen for the opportunity and watch for the opportunity that God is placing in your path so that you might be able to act upon it. Would you pray with me? Our dear Father in heaven, once again we, we bow our heads before you, having come to the conclusion of another time of looking into the Bible. And today we looked at the, the message of, of Barnabas and Paul as they confronted one who, who would deter them from spreading that gospel. And Father, we saw that in spite of what might have been uh, a place they were unfamiliar with, a, a person who seemed to have great importance and, and in spite of a detractor who had the ear of that important person, Barnabas and Paul forged ahead. They, they proclaimed that they were Christians 
And they told the, the proconsul Sergius, let me tell you why. Father, bless us that we might have that opportunity, that we might come face to face with someone who, who does not know, and bless us that we might have the, the courage to speak to them the words that we know, the message that we know. We recognize, Father, that we perhaps don't have all the answers, but we have all the beginnings. We just ask, Father, that you bless us, that we might come in contact with someone who's waiting to have a, a beginning of their own, and that through helping to provide that beginning to them, they might be able to come and, and draw closer to you in spirit and in the knowledge that you are in your heaven and all is right with the world. We thank you, Father, for watching over us daily, for granting us the blessings that we need in order to to get ahead in our own lives and in order to benefit the lives of those who are around us. Uh, we thank you, Father, for that knowledge. We thank you for that message. We thank you for that man, that Son of God, who brought that message to us. Thank you, Father, for your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Once again, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your week to, to visit with me. Uh, I consider it an honor to have you here and, a, and just a tremendous privilege to be able to, to share the Word of God as I read it and understand it, as I am able to perhaps do a little research that maybe you're not familiar with. Uh, I enjoy it. I hope you do too. I learn a great deal. I hope you learn enough to at least move one person a step closer to the Lord that you follow. Until next week. I wish you well. God bless.